Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Celtic View podcast and absolutely delighted this week that we have a former Celt on the show, a former product of our youth academy and now a soccer who's been starring at the, the recent World Cup. We have Jackson Irvin on the show. Jackson, how are you? Very well, mate. How you doing? Very good, yeah. Very good. Um, it's obviously must have been a, a busy last couple of months from you. We'll kind of get into the World Cup a little bit later on properly but how, how's the last few months been for you? Yeah obviously quite unusual um, you know the Winter World Cup and the mid-season break and everything this is kind of come at a bit of a strange time but um, yeah the World Cup obviously was incredible and then having a bit of time off in, in December which is I haven't had in about since I've you know since I came over to Scotland in 2009 so you know at Christmas Christmas time in Australia in summer um yeah, for the first time in a long time. So yeah, very it's been it's been good. But back in Germany now and ready to crack on next week with the second half of the season. But I mean, yeah, it's definitely better weather than, than what we've had over Christmas. It's like minus five this morning, so you you didn't you didn't miss out on much at all. Um, we want to get through kind of your your Celtic career, um, in just a little moment. But first of all, I just wanted to ask you about um, if you've kind of been still keeping up to date with Celtic since you left, and particularly. This current squad under Ange Postecoglou, somebody that you, you know quite well, are you still kind of keeping up to date with things? Uh, yeah, I always have kind of been kind of considered myself a fan of the club, obviously, ever since I, since I played there. And, um, you know, all my all my mates and uh, kind of extended family from, from, from Glasgow are all, are all supporters. So it's always kind of part of the conversation. And, um, you know, I still watch the games when I can, especially, you know, obviously previously with, with Tom being in squad and now with Aaron um, when you've got friends playing you always kind of keep tabs on on the other players the Aussie boys that are playing overseas as well so um, yeah obviously keep a close eye and, and try and watch games whenever I can You'll be one person who is probably least shocked at the job that Ange Postecoglou has done I think actually you you called it in the was it Open Goal podcast a couple of years ago saying about getting him into yeah. Europe somewhere he's coming at Celtic and just been absolutely on fire yeah, wild. Um, it's so funny how, how it kind of turns in that way. Like, obviously, I spoke about about Ange. It was literally, I think, a couple of weeks before before he got the job. And, um, you know, obviously, straight away, people started referring back to that clip when he started getting linked with the job. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's funny. People, people were giving, I was getting a hard time off it. People being like, oh, yeah, buddy. Jackson Irvine says he's good, he must be great. Then who the hell is this guy? Um, and then obviously he's come in and done unbelievably well. Everybody, everyone who's ever worked with him and knows what he's about and knew that um, it was a recipe for success and obviously delighted to see how well he's how well he's done and the transformation in the team in such a short space of time. It's been obviously very impressive to watch. Is it exactly the same as what you remember working under him with Australia? I think... Um, by principle, yeah, a lot of it is the same. Obviously, getting to work these players, getting to work with him on the day to day, every day, um, will be you know, hugely different to us trying to you know come in and do such short preparations in international windows and um, combine the travel. But even in that, he was so he was so good at getting those clear principles into place and getting us to understand systems and and really buy in. And really buy into you know the philosophy of, of the way he wanted to play and um you know you can see you know that's even gone up a level obviously with the the ability to work with players on the day to day so yeah as I said as I said before not a surprise to those who've worked with him in the past that, that he's brought success to the club and on a, a personal level with him as well is he still exactly the same type of character as you remember um I suppose in the kind of from the media front, yeah, I suppose I suppose he definitely is the same. I'm sure, as I say, he's probably got a very different relationship with players um, when you, as I say, work with them, obviously more on the day to day. But um, you know, still that that wit and um, quick, quick humour is, is still always been kind of present. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it, it, it's it's nice to see. Obviously, myself knowing the Scottish media and uh, British football media in general and. He definitely handles it in a pretty pretty unique way, as I'm sure people have seen. Yeah, I think the Celtic fans have, have really taken to it as well since he's, since he's come in. Yeah. Um, Jackson, let's kind of start off with talking about your career now. Um, obviously, born and from Melbourne, Australia, 
So just tell us exactly how you managed to end up at Celtic and in Glasgow. Yeah, it was kind of a bizarre set of circumstances. Um, obviously, growing up in Australia, your kind of pathways to professional football are, are very limited, especially at that time. You know, the, the A-League, as we know it now, was kind of in its in its infancy and there wasn't really a clear pathway for young players to kind of progress, especially and have careers in Europe. So um, it was just kind of a bit of luck. Um, it was uh, um, Michael O'Halloran, um, who's one of the, the academy coaches at the club and um, his, his, his cousin, Tommy was, was my coach in Melbourne. And, um, you know, I, I was playing over there kind of doing pretty well at the age of kind of 15, 16. And they offered me the chance to kind of come over and, um, you know, it was a, it was a trial, but I don't think we kind of went into it with any real expectations. Um, I was across visiting some family. My dad's from Scotland, as I'm sure a lot of people know, and we've got a lot of family there. So we got, we used to go there quite a lot when we got the chance and, um, you know, I went in and trained for, trained for a few days and, um, yeah, I don't know, just must've done something right. Got lucky and, um, got that chance to, to come in and full time and, then you know, I had to make that massive transition as a, as a young person coming over and moving to the other side of the world and kind of trying to make it in football. So, um, yeah, it was obviously, yeah, I'm very thankful also. You know, as you get older, you start to recognise that, of course, that, that opportunity was um, was there for me through you know, a bit of luck but also circumstance and also, you know, the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that my family could afford to, to bring me over and, and give me that chance to try because I know that's that's a limitation that stops a lot of kids from even having the opportunity to go and trial and try and have that career. So I'm obviously very thankful to my family as well for giving me that chance to come over and, and have a crack. And, um, you know, obviously the club gave me a chance to build a, a career and um, that's, yeah, kind of where it all started. I mean, I could only imagine, though, going in for a, a trial, was it pretty nerve-wracking knowing that, a move was pretty much on the line, depending on how you performed in those training sessions. Like, talk us through what that was like. I think it was kind of the opposite for me. I think that's probably one of the reasons I did well because I, I didn't really feel pressure by it because I didn't see it as a real, realistic kind of pathway. It was like, you know, you're coming over to train with, you know, one of the biggest clubs in Europe. And it's like, I don't know, you just saw it as like an amazing experience to kind of go and, and build on, you know, I suppose. I didn't, I never really thought of it as a, at that time and I think that's probably why I probably played well and with maybe a little bit less pressure because it was I didn't have that expectation going in and um but yeah and then once you're in that meeting I remember after my trial game um up at Lennox Town on like a Tuesday night in December it was like I've never I'd never seen snow before you know basically I'd never been to Europe in, in the winter time so um I was absolutely dying of cold and I remember after the game at Lennox Town on the Astro, they brought me upstairs into one of the offices at Lennox Town and there was like all the youth coaches, a couple of the, um, you know, Chris McCart, head of youth and, you know, a few other people and everything. And I just thought, ah, oh, this is, this must be what happens at the end of your trial. You know, you sit down and they, they tell you how you went and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And my parents didn't even come, weren't even there. They, I think they were up in Aberdeen seeing my dad's family. I was staying with my auntie who was there with me. Um, as I say, this is the level of expectation that, that was on the, this at this training time. And, yeah, they took me upstairs and I just remember they'll be like, yeah, you've done really well. And, um, you know, if, if you'd like to, to stay, um, we're, we're going to offer you a contract. And, you know, you just kind of like, what? Like, no way. And then I think, I think the first question I asked them was like, I feel like I still go to school. Like, what about school? Like, I had, I had full-time football for me. It was just like an absolute, I had no idea. I was like, what does that mean? Like, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. So. Um, yeah, as I say, the whole experience was just bizarre to me. I had no idea of what I was doing, or how I was going into it. Just used to playing on kind a of Sunday league with my mates in Australia, and then kind of dropped into you know one of the biggest clubs in in the world. As I said, so yeah, it was a funny, funny kind of period for me those first few months. <laughs> That's brilliant. And then after that, though, I suppose you signed the contract, and it's then about adapting into a new life in Glasgow. How did you find that adaptation? Yeah, it was uh, obviously something different. Um, I went straight into living in, in digs in, in Hamilton with, with a couple of couple of um, other players, um, Lewis Toshi and Callum Bagshaw, and they very quickly taught me, you know, what it was like to be part of a football dressing room and environment. Absolutely, you know, tortured me, like, in, in, in the best way possible, you know, just having a laugh and, you know, constantly um, 
messing around and stuff. And yeah, you know, that was a, a great introduction to being a part of like a dressing room with, you know, it was, um, you know, a lot of really good, really good players and good characters as well. You know, like Jamesy Forrest and um, Declan Gallagher, James Keatings or Richie Towell. Like this, that was kind of the ones that were a couple of years above me at that stage and Stephen O'Donnell as well. And, um, you know, it was a good dressing room to be a part of as a young guy, but, you know, they made it tough for you as well, but, you know, it's good for you in the long run. I mean, that youth team as well, you kind of mentioned some of the names that were involved in it. So you're adapting to life off the pitch in Glasgow. You're then trying to adapt to life on the pitch as well. What were the kind of differences that you, you first noticed going from Australia and then coming into that environment at Celtic? Just probably the biggest first thing to kind of adjust to was just the mindset, the mentality of being at a, at a big club. Um, I just remember every game, no matter you know, no matter what it was, if it was a friendly, if it was a testimonial, if it was a you know, under-19, under-17 league game, the expectation, like, we are Celtic, we win this game, like, that is the absolute minimal, and we don't just win it, we win it well, you know, we, it's, uh, it was, that was a kind of huge learning curve for me, and it's something I've probably taken with me and through my career is that winning mentality, because, um, there's not a lot of clubs that kind of have that level of expectation every time you step on the pitch, as I say, no matter what, at what level. And, you know, it taught me a lot. And that was probably one of the biggest things to adapt to early doors was just that real sense of expectation and, and high standards all the time. And kind of your coaches at that level as well, who were your initial coaches and what, and what were they like with you? Uh, so Stevie Frail, um, obviously Chris McCart was the head of the youth and Tommy McIntyre kind of the ones who worked with most in the day-to-day -day at that time and then um actually Neil Lennon was the reserve manager in my first year when I first came in so if you got off to train with the reserves he and him and Danny McGrain were taking the reserves at that time as well and um again they they were hard on you but you know but they were they were good and as you say they really helped kind of push me kind of and you know I, I kind of came into the dressing room and as I say Scottish football probably as people have seen as my career has carried on with probably a little bit of a different personality to what they were kind of used to working with, maybe a mild way of putting it. And, um, you know, we clashed on a lot of stuff as well. Um, but I think if anything, as I say, it helped me get stronger and probably um, understand more of myself off the pitch as well. And sometimes you need that little bit of pushback. Um, I'm not sure they were always the most pleased with me kind of pushing back at, at that age, but that's always been part of my personality. And, um, I definitely think it helped me develop as a player and as a person kind of through those years. So what type of things were you clashing over? I think I heard one story about uh, kind of later on in your Celtic career and Scott Brown wanting to maybe try and cut off your hair when you were growing it. So is it those types of things? Oh, the, hair, the hair was a constant cause of debate. They were always telling me to cut my hair and I was always trying to grow my hair and they just wouldn't. It, was, it, was, it sounds ridiculous when you say it now, but really it was like a... You know, this was the time of, you know, clean cut, black boots, you know, this was that. And then all of a sudden you've got me swaggering in in homemade tie-dye T-shirts and, you know, growing my hair out and wanting to pierce my ears and doing all this stuff. And they were just, I think everyone was just a bit like, what, you know, what's going on? And, um, but yeah, just the stuff like that constantly. And even, um, you know, life off the pitch, I was always wanted to go out and be out and about and doing stuff. And, you know, it was obviously... Always trying to find a balance between professional life and personal life, and um, I kind of got me in a bit of trouble a few times as well in the academy days. Okay, I've heard that before um, with with Neil Lennon. I think during his time as first team manager and reserves as well. In terms of like those standards of you know if you're playing in youth teams, everyone has to wear black boots and you have to kind of follow that sort of regimented system. Was that the case when you were there? So did you find yourself kind of button heads with people? Yeah, I think that was probably the thing I struggled most with was like kind of I've always liked to express myself in different ways. And um, I think, you know, coming into an environment that demanded like that kind of, um, you know, a, a different kind of attitude, I guess, for me was it was, was something I had to kind of adjust to. And they had to give a little bit back to me as well to kind of, um, you know, make sure that you don't, you don't want to crush the personality out of young players in the same way. But at the same time, you want to make sure that everybody's doing the right thing and as you say maintaining this high standard so it's about finding that balance um i think you know as the games developed and you know move kind of move forward i think we're seeing a little bit more give and take in that department but um you know i think 
it was always yeah I think for me that was always part of the the struggle of trying to find that that balance between obviously toeing the line um with within everything else but still wanting to have that kind of freedom to express yourself as well yeah I mean that youth team that you were involved in when you you first came in you've mentioned some of the names before it was a a really strong youth team. You won the Youth Cup, I think, in, in 2011 as well, uh, beating Rangers in the final. So what was that kind of team like to be involved in? And as you mentioned, like, like kind of James Forrest was in there and, and Cal McGregor. So you had some really kind of big players that have went on to have really good careers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. obviously Cal is the kind of epitome of, of what that, that kind of youth team represented and kind of me and Cal kind of came through obviously we're the same age and came through playing in midfield together through those years and um you know his ability was just always so clear and um but the way he's developed as a character as well and into a leader has been so impressive to see and you know to be now from an academy player to captain of the club is is, is an incredible achievement and but yeah a few uh, some over those kind of two three seasons through seven, like 17 to 19, um, some fantastic players, as I say, they've gone on to have really good careers and, and, and a lot of guys, you know, I'm still good friends with as well. Um, so it's, yeah, it's been, as I say, it's, it's difficult at times because it's competitive as well. You've got, you know, guys that are all trying to, you want to play together and your mates and everything, but you're all trying to progress as well. And not everybody's going to have that opportunity to step up and, and, and play senior football at the club and, um, the ones that, that do have to, have to deserve that, that respect for everybody who gets that, that, that chance as well. So obviously Jamesy and Carl are still ever-present. and um, But I think a lot of those guys went on to make debuts and, and play games like Bill McGeek and Philip Twardzik and um, Joe Chalmers, Marcus Fraser, all kind of got games um, through those years. And, and uh, you know, got Daniel Fisher gone on to, to you know, have, have good careers in the game as well. When you remember Callum back at that age, I think a lot of the time with footballers, you can see right away if, if someone's going to make it. And a lot of the people that we've spoken to that have been in that kind of similar age group to yourselves have always thought Callum was going to be the one that kind of breaks into the first team. Would, is that something you would agree with back then? Or has he kind of surpassed the level that you even thought he could have reached? I think he's definitely surpassed them, but not in a sense that I didn't think he had the ability to be a top player and everything. But um, as you say, I think the way he developed as a character, as much as the ability of the player, has been the most impressive to see. And, um, you know, he was quite a quiet kid, you know, when we were, we were 17, 18. And um, I think, it's, as you say, it's not always a, the same pathway people take into, into football. And you look at someone like uh, KT, KT here in Tierney, who broke in at 17 and then you look at someone like Cal who you know was probably one of the last of those players I just mentioned to actually make their debut and you know went, went down on loan to England and, and came back and, and had a kind of a, was playing out wide in the beginning and just had a totally different pathway to being the player that he is now and um, you know uh, established international player um, and you say and, and Celtic captain um, I would say I always backed him to be the one who went on to have you know, one of the top careers, but I think um, what he what he's actually gone and achieved is is yeah is a level above even um, what, what probably I thought it, thought it at that time would have happened. But as I said, it's probably testament to the way he's developed as a person as much as a player. Yeah, well, you can kind of take us back to what he was like then, and that changing him. You mentioned he was probably quite quiet then. Now he's obviously the the leader of the team and the the main voice that's driving everyone forward. So, kind of what type of character was he like I take it he wasn't joining you in nights out then at that age if he was quite quieter ah uh, no nah, he was I say quiet like he was still like present in the dressing room he was you know he, he liked to have a laugh and um you know and, and we used to we used to have our like, youth team nights out where we'd bloody go down to Newcastle or whatever and do it and Cal was always you know a part of that he was very much part of the group and everything he wasn't like a quiet kid in the corner but as I say he maybe didn't have that same that voice and you know kind of aggression um, on the park that, that you see that you see now and um, you know he's not just a leader by actions he's a leader with by voice as well so um, I think that's yeah that's a development that yeah, I think you know obviously working with Bruni as well over those years probably had a big part to play and you know 
um, helping him grow into that role. Yeah, I want to touch now kind of on your journey then from the youth team into the first team. Just talk us through what it's like as a player when you're kind of getting that call for the first time, even just to go into to training with the first team. I know you said before about your trial where you weren't nervous. Was that the same when you were then going into that first team environment? Oh, yeah, it was horrible. Like, people think it's like, people, I don't know, people think it's like when you go into that, it's like, oh, great, all these great players and everything. I hated it. It was first, like, that first year when you used to get the call up to go in there and you'd get that thing, you know, you'd be on the bottom pitch at Lanx Town ever and someone would get injured or someone dropped out of training and someone would just give you a shout to, like, to come up and you'd get dropped into the middle of a session and, oh, uh, you were just, like, you felt like you were just crumbled and like that was what I was kind of like at that age anyway like I um, used to get so nervous didn't want to give the ball away didn't want to make a mistake didn't want to like um, you know do anything stupid but then as you say the more you you do it and the more you get used to kind of being in that environment with those players then it gets easier but in the beginning oh um, yeah it was absolutely awful just like so nervous it felt like there was so much pressure like every training session was like the World Cup final like oh my god every touch like you've got to do something good I've got to show that I'm that I'm half decent and then, you know, you end up overthinking things and stuff. But as you say, the more comfortable you get, the easier it gets. Because I've heard with, with Neil Lennon, who was obviously the manager at that time, that he would almost treat the young players the same as he would the first team players. So was, would he be quite ruthless at times during training or maybe some of his coaching staff or, or what would they like with you? Yeah, well, uh, as I say, as, as you kind of develop and uh, uh, he was always he was always good with us in that way. So they say, I don't think he really treated us like any different. Um, you know, the demand was always there. As you say, it's you're a Celtic player. That was the kind of attitude of everybody involved. Like you're there for a reason, and you know you've got to be maintain those standards. Whether you know you know played two hundred games or two games. Um, so that was kind of my feeling, and um, it was just all about always about like obviously the respect for the older players, the senior players, and as younger guys because. You know, you're there to, um, you know, you want to learn from them as much and, and as kind of push yourself in that way as well. So um, it was, again, find a bit of a balance between like going in and don't want to run around booting people, trying to like show that you're good or anything, you, don't, you know, because that's, that's not what the, the, those players need, but um, you still want to show a bit as well. So yeah, you made your debut in 2012, I think it was September, in the 2-2 draw with Tibbs. Were you kind of involved in squads before that or what was that kind of moment like when you were knowing you were kind of potentially going to be making your debut? Like, what was that kind of opening season like for you? Yeah, I've been involved with kind of, I think the opening kind of 10 games of that season in 2012 as in either being on the bench or in the stand as in like away with the squad for most of that. I did the pre-season and then came in and then played. Um, yeah, and then was involved in kind of that. But then, you know, actually making your debuts at, a different story altogether. You know, I think there had been a couple of games before that where I'd been quite close to kind of coming on and um, it just hadn't quite had that chance yet. And then, you know, to make your debut, you know, obviously coming on at half time at Celtic Park was an incredible feeling. And, um, you know, I think I was I was quite relaxed in that sense as well because I think at that time, I think there were two or three kind of other academy boys on the pitch the same day. And even just looking around and seeing seeing those faces, you know, it takes a, it takes a little bit of the edge off. But, doesn't change as I say the expectation to go out and, and win games and um you know it's uh, it's fine lines at the, these points in your career when you come on and play in these games and you know that moment for you can either be you know really special and go on and come on and score a debut goal or do something or you know, unfortunately but uh, in that game for me you know a couple of mistakes and you know we end up drawing the game and it, it's kind of not got quite the same quite the same energy but you know, that's that's football as well and not everything goes kind of as you imagine it I suppose in that sense as well because it wasn't quite the debut that you would have hoped for yeah I mean I'm really fascinated by people's debuts because it's something like for myself as a grown-up as a Celtic fan it's, it's what the one thing you would have wanted to, to dream of doing but only kind of a select few actually get to do it so when you're kind of coming on at half time I think you came on for, for Victor Wanyama what was Neil Lennon saying to you, did he get, did he say anything in particular to you? Like, what was your, what were your feelings like in that moment? I remember exactly what he said to me because I remember coming into the dressing room at half time, and like, I've been warming up and then we came in and got my shirt and everything, and 
he took me over to the side and just like we were watching the first half and he was like I was like yeah he was like you what you watch Victor and I was like yeah and he was like do what he did <laughs> I was like oh, okay right little skinny 19 year old Jack Snowman I was like just gonna run around like the absolute machine that Victor Wanyama was but now that was um that was what I tried to kind of model my game on I was I was a kind of much more of a defensive midfielder at that time played more in that role and um that was my that was my pre-match team talk that's all I needed to do go on do what Victor does um but yeah that's easier said than done are you still keeping that with you to this day before you go out, look in the mirror, being like, right, okay, be like Victor Wanyama? Play like Wanyama. No, no, no. So, um, yeah, I, I wish, I wish. That's what, that's what I'll try and say. Like, if I could get near that level, then that would have been quite good. <laughs> I mean, uh, that debut, you came on and it was, it was 2-1, ended up being 2-2 in the end. Do you have any kind of memories of, of after that match? Because I know kind of what, what Neil Lennon would have been like and victories would have been so important in getting the results as well so what was he like in the changing room in moments like that well I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the James Forrest the sandwich story that Char I think Charlie Mulgrew has told it a couple of times I think that actually happened after that game so that kind of summed up the the prawn sandwich um if anyone needs to hear it again go and look it up but it's, uh, <laughs> that was I think that that took place after that game I'm sure so um yeah, it was. It wasn't quite the, uh, as you say, jolly environment of a of a dream debut. That's for sure. It was you know, two drop points at home. So, um, yeah, it was intense. And as I say, as a young player, it's sometimes it's tough to to sit in that environment and you know get bollocked and you know hear harsh realities. But uh, as you say, the, those moments can kind of push you one way or the other. You can either crumble or you can learn from it and grow. And you know, that's what I tried to do. So. Um, yeah, as you say, it wasn't 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 perfect, but you know, it was a, a great experience. Yeah, I mean, I think that season for you, you're a bit unlucky with injuries later on, um, in that ca calendar year, which kept you out for for most of that season. But I mean, just I suppose as a young player trying to break into that midfield where you had the likes of Wanyama, as you said, and Scott Brown, of course, was captain, and and Joe Ledley, and that was a team that done amazing things in Europe that season as well. So just. How much did you learn from from that experience, but also how difficult was it to break in? Yeah, um, mentally difficult. Obviously, um, Bruni and um, Victor were kind of playing it as well, but obviously Joe Ledley, Keystone Young, Baron Kyle. We're talking five, six international top class players in the middle of the park at that time, and you know it was obviously amazing for me to kind of learn from those players and train with them, and you know try and develop and. I say, um, you know, I got an opportunity to even get on the pitch at, at that time, albeit with, you know, obviously a few injuries. Uh, that's obviously how you're going to get that, those kinds of opportunities in the first place. But, um, yeah, immensely talented midfield, as you said, did, did wonderful things in Europe that year. And um, obviously, you know, most of them either went on to the Premier League or had, had you know, fantastic careers as well. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a great place to be around and learn from at that time. Yeah, and then after that, I mean, you ended up going out and, and loan to, to Kilmarnock and then to Ross County and permanent move as well. But I think for a lot of players, they always kind of say that their first club and their first experiences are, are some of the most important, if not the most important, and the players have become later on in their career. So when you think back of that time and that development at, at Celtic, do you think that has been such an important aspect of the career you've now had? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, one, just for a sh pure opportunity and giving me the chance to obviously build that career in the game, but as a learning environment, um, mentally and, and everything else, it, 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 it's, some, it's stuff I've, I've kept with me my whole career and, you know, even going into those initial loans and, you know, struggling, you know, play, playing, going out and, um, you know, playing SPL. I was quite fortunate. It was a you know, fantastic loan move and opportunity for me to go straight in and play at the, you know, around, again, around other top players like Alexi Aramenko and Harry Nicholson, guys like great pros who had fantastic careers as well. And I learned a lot in those experiences too. So um, I've always been fortunate to be around those those kinds of players to, to develop from. But, um, you know, I think, you know, you, you, as you say, your first club is is the one that you, you look back to, the ones that give you that platform to kind of even have a career in the game. Um, 
know, that's why they, they, they stay with you um, as much as, you know, as it means five, six years of your life and in incredibly important years in your life as well. You know, 16 to 22, you kind of, you know, develop so much as a person in the, at that time as well. I essentially grew up in Glasgow. I feel, you know, it's more as much of a home to me as Melbourne. And, um, yeah, as you say, that, that never really leaves you. Yeah, and I mean, you've had a, a great career as well since leaving Celtic and now at St. Pauli in, in Germany. How's that experience been for you over the, the last couple of years? And it's it's quite fitting as well because I think both Celtic and St. Pauli have, have quite a good connection between between both of the clubs. Yeah, well, I'd actually, I was actually in, I was on the bench uh, in 2014 or 15 when Celtic played St. Pauli here in a friendly and, and um, on a pre-season tour and um that was my first time ever at the Milan tour here in Hamburg. And um, this club is, yeah, it's truly unique and special. And you can see the parallels um, of why the Celtic and St. Pauli friendship has, has, has lasted so long. And um, as much as, you know, out on field um, success in history is obviously not in anywhere near the same category, but the, the um, alliance of values and is probably what, what brings the clubs close together. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm, might, might be the only player who's played for both. So for me, that's a pretty, pretty cool uh, thing to be able to, to say as well. And um, yeah, it's funny how your career can sometimes feel like it's come full, full circle ending up back at a club um, like this. And, you know, as you say, the connections that you have when you, when you're involved in these kinds of, of clubs and environments is, is why you grow so attached. And um, I've, I've had that with almost every club I've been at. It's, part of the way I try and embrace a community as well as a football club. But um, these two clubs in particular, you know, they leave a, a special mark on you. And you said at the start that you're still kind of class yourself as a, a Celtic fan. It's been been really good to see in over the last couple of months in that Australia squad when you turned up in the, the Celtic top with Viduka in the back and we actually had someone, we said you were coming on, who wanted to ask, um, it was at BobBoy79 on Twitter, Wanted to know what the players' reaction was like when you turned up in that Viduka top. Yeah, I got a pretty good reaction gen generally. Obviously, we've got a lot of boys that play in Scotland now, so um, it's it's got an even even more of a connection between Australia and Scotland. And um, I think a lot of people who probably didn't know beforehand, like I, I've worn number thirty six for most of my career, and um, it was that was the number I made my debut in um, for Celtic, and it was actually at that time when I got told that that was the number. Duke's for um, at Celtic as well. So it's always been a special number to me as well. And um, yeah, I came across it one day and I was like, oh my God, that, that has to go. And people also probably know I'm a lover of retro football shirts too. So um, it was an absolutely essential one for the collection. And um, I'm glad it got such a, a good reaction as well because it's one of my favourites. Oh, it's Dave. I think that's one of my favourites as well. I've got one of those um, with Larson on the back of it as well. And it's just, the kit in general is amazing. But then when you've got those amazing players to put in the back of it, it's just, it's just brilliant. But did did Mark did he reach out to you at all? Did he see it? I'm not sure if he's seen it. Um, I've actually I've been very lucky in my kind of in my career um, to meet that kind of generation of of internet of Australians. Um, you know, I played with Tim Cahill for the national team for a number of years. I've, I've got a good relationship with Harry Kuehl now. Obviously, he's involved with the club. He was a massive help for me. Um, you know, when I need when I was training during during COVID times as as well when he was manager of Oldham and um, you know, how, Mark's one of the the Duke is one of the players I've I've never had the chance to meet. So I'm glad I'm gonna have a good icebreaker the first time I've hopefully ever have a chance to have a coffee with him. I'll be like, mate, I've 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 got a a good story for you. So um, I'll save that one for the when I get a chance to to see him. <laughs> That's brilliant, and yeah, hopefully we get to see you in a few more retro Celtic tops in the. The next few years, keep digging them out because uh, the Celtic fans, <laughs> Celtic fans certainly love to to see you in it. But um, Jackson, thank you so much for taking out the time to speak with us. Really, really appreciate it, and it's it's great to hear all those stories again of, of you breaking through at Celtic. And um, yeah, I'm sure all the Celtic fans will appreciate hearing from you again. So so thank you so much for taking out the time. No worries, mate. Anytime.